<laughs> Unless we won't. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, there are refreshments at the back of the room, and help yourself to those. And uh, there are books out here, too. So um, if you need refreshments, you can do that while I'm making my cursory comments here at the beginning. Welcome to the 2010 Tabula Poetica Reading Series. We are happy to have you all here this evening. And we hope that you'll return for the other poetry events remaining this fall. So mark your calendars. Everybody got your calendar out? Uh, October 12th is Lynn Thompson. November 9th is Allison Joseph. And then we wrap up the series with a reading by our own MFA students on November 30th. And all of those events are on Tuesdays. If you want more details about the series, uh, go to our website. You can get to our website through the Chapman University website. Or if you're a Facebook member, join our group on Facebook. It's called Tabula Poetica. Please take a moment right now to make sure your cell phones are turned off or silenced. Um, as I said, Barnes & Noble has a table just outside the back of this room, and they have books not only by Patty Seaburn, they have two of her books, but also books by all the other poets in the series. And as I said last time, if you were at that reading, if you can afford to buy poetry books, that's an excellent investment in culture and your own edification. So grab some poetry books out there. After the reading, we'll have a little bit of time for book signing as well. And in addition to the poet's books, we also have copies on the table of Dirt Cakes. I think Patty is going to read a poem from Dirt Cakes. And we have the editor of Dirt Cakes here, Catherine Keefe, right back there. Um, so check that out, too. I want to thank the Department of English for tremendous support of Tabula Poetica these last two years, and thanks to poets and writers for grants to support each writer's visit. And then we have Professor Logan Esdale. He's been part of Tabula Poetica from its inception, and I especially appreciate his contributions to the project's ongoing success. We also have Tabula Poetica's graduate assistant, Natalie Dove. Is she here? There she is. OK. And uh, the English department's admin, Jennifer Klunk. They've both worked very hard to make this year's series happen. On to this evening. Tonight, we have a special guest to introduce Patty Seaburn. Patrick Quinn is the Dean of Wilkinson College of Humanities and Social Sciences. He is a member of the English department, the department that I think is the best department in Wilkinson. And he's a Robert Graves scholar. He does a lot of other scholarly work. He has a lot of, a lot of other areas of interest, but Robert Graves is a poet, so he gets top billing tonight. Dean Quinn came to us just over a year ago from Ole Miss. Before that, he acquired a hefty amount of international teaching and educational experiences abroad, including his PhD from the University of Warwick. But supposedly, he sticks to places that begin with the letter O. As my dean, Patrick Quinn has promoted crossing disciplinary as well as geographical boundaries, has cheered on Tabula Poetica since he arrived at Chapman University, and has participated in our Chapman Reads Poetry video series, which you can see on our website. I imagine that humanities and social sciences faculty are not the easiest cats to herd, but he recognizes that we are a pretty good bunch and is doing a good job moving all of us forward. Please help me welcome Dean Patrick Quinn. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I, before I introduce our reader, I, I have to ask a question. I, I'm hoping you'll all be able to answer it with me. I, I mean, Poetry is strange, isn't it? Right? I mean, think about it for a second. I, I mean, I remember when I was 14. I read poetry, and I thought poetry was about nature. Remember that when you were a kid? It's all about nature. And then I turned 20, just a few years ago, and I, <laughs> I thought poetry was about love. And so, you know, everything I read was about love. I, I remember picking up Keats and Shelley and 
and just saying, this is it. I'm there. I've arrived. I understand the world now. And then I was 25, and I read Robert Graves, and I realized it was about the eternal battle between the masculine and the feminine. So I knew poetry actually really wasn't about love. It was about how do you hold on to it? What's wrong with it? How come I can't have it? Uh, questions like that. And then, magic of all, I turned 40. And I realized I was wrong all along. What, you know, what a shock, right? Uh, I realized poetry was really about asking the big questions. What is life? What are we doing here? What is the nature of free will? What is the nature of determinism? All those questions really are what poetry is about. And, and I, I discovered Constantine Kavafis, the great, great Alexandrian Greek poet. My life changed. I knew what poetry was about. Now, as you know from my introduction, I spent many years abroad. So coming back to the United States, I had a very peculiar attitude to what poetry was because it's very Europeanized as opposed to Americanized. And I remember about, I don't know, maybe eight, ten years ago, I picked up the Paris Review, which I read all the time when I was in Europe, as one does. I mean, when you're in Europe, you read the Paris Review. And I remember coming across a poem, and this is what makes the world so interesting to me, called The Alphabetizer Speaks. And the second stanza in that poem drove me crazy. It was a question that Patty puts to her daughter, really, or a question about her daughter. She wonders if she's going to stay in the same world that she inhabits. And I have to read this to you. And I hope, Patty, you weren't going to read this poem because I'd probably ruin it for you. But I just want you to hear this. And, and, and now you know what I'm talking about, right? She says, will my daughter carry on in this way? Will she continue to live in the world in which I do? And she says, I cannot yet tell her qualities if she prefers scale to chance sequence to random, and this may mean nothing. I find chaos theory appealing, an eavesdrop on talk of black holes, chasms, any abyss that fetters sense. I, I relish the desultory in many matters, am slovenly, a slacker, a slave to caprice, except with the letters, with the letters, with what makes poetry. Wow, you know, I, I finished that and I put it down. And I thought, this is one of the big questions. What is a poet? What kind of world do we want to inhabit? And what about the power of the word? Remember, in the beginning was the word, says John. What does that mean? That's the kind of questions I like to answer. Those are the kind of questions poetry were made to answer. And in this world of the securities of technology, and science with their answers, really all they do is ask more questions. And only we, the poetic few, are able to answer them. And that's what Patty does. She asks the questions and she answers them beautifully. So I can't wait to hear what awaits for us tonight. I have to tell you the few things that everybody has to say about Patty Seaburn. She is at California State University at Long Beach as assistant professor. She has won a number of poetic awards, including the Pushcart Prize for The Case for Free Will, which is one of the reasons why I find her poetry interesting. It's a question I'm always asking myself. She seems to be fascinated by the question of free will, and that interests me a great deal. But above all, her poems are exceedingly readable. They make you think, and they make you glad you came out on a day like today to hear her. So may I please introduce Patty Siever. Thank you. I think I have to stand up a little straighter after that introduction. Actually, first, I just want to thank um, Anna and everyone for uh, bringing me here. I've had a fabulous day of talking about poetry, poetry, poetry. It's been quite wonderful. I feel uh, happy, uh, ebullient, 
a little tired. That's okay. That's good too. Um, but mostly just so grateful to do what I do. And of course, most of all, thank you to you. Thanks to you all for being here and for listening. What I disliked about the Pleistocene era. The pastries were awfully dry, an absence of hummingbirds, of any humming, and birds led feathers made it difficult to fly. Clouds had not yet learned to clot, billow, represent. Stars unshot, anonymous, moon and sun, indifferent. No one owned a house, a pond, a rock on which to rest your head. No ark, no here, then there. Beginning meant alive. The end was dead. Art still a ways away. No liar. Beauty, an accident. Needs and wants bundled like twigs, then set on fire, except no fire. Candles had no wicks, fruit lacked seed, books bereft of plot, ornaments and condiment were empty cisterns, there were pots. It was pure act, no motivation, consequence, imagination, sometimes a flare, a glow, a gleam, no questions asked, no revelation. An eye was not yet capital I, still just an eye, no mouth, no verb, no am to carry dark from day, dirt or sea from sky. God not God until one dove called out, where the hell's dry land? An answer formed, a raven shrugged and towed a line across the sand. Knew the sand, knew the vast notion of this long division, knew the understanding that this time there would be no revision. I wrote this next poem, um, you know, when I first moved to California, I was told to not write poems about the ocean, uh, because that's a cliche. And I was a very good graduate student. I dutifully listened to my professor, and I did not write poems about the ocean. Although I grew up in Detroit, a place devoid of the kind of natural beauty we have here in Southern California, and, uh, and I finally was living amidst this beauty, but I listened, and I didn't write ocean poems. And then at some point I thought, what the hell? And I um, decided that, that this was my terrain and I would ha just have to find a way to own it myself that hadn't been done before. This uh, s brief series of poems is called In Re, as in a memo format. And the epigraph is from a friend of mine's son uh, who, as a child, apparently looked up from the dinner table, pointed at something, and said, Duck! God! We don't know what he was looking at. <laughs> we don't know what he saw, if he was just naming nouns, duck god, or what uh, you can imagine everybody looking around <laughs> where. Um, but I thought that was sort of fabulous. So this is Inri, the ocean. And uh, the most important thing I should tell you is that this series of poems is actually from the point of view um, of God is speaking, one of, the, one of the arrogances that you get to assume as a poet. So this is from the point of view of God, the ocean. You must admit, it was inspired. At first I thought the waves should go out, originating at some juncture in the sand. I considered lifting them up, completely vertical. Someone had the gall to call that heretical. Finally, I arrived at their present state, in constant arrival, in tears, a series hemmed by white spume, white caps, a little ornament, like the eye on the peacock's wing. I have an affection for frills. Some say 
there, all that. Eyebrows, cheekbones, attractive, curvature, ligature. What's so wrong with detail? At first, the sea had no qualities, no physics, and my, arch and my archangels complained. I granted sound to Gabriel, taxed by the scales of justice. Smell to Michael, wearied by cutting people slack all day, every day, with no reprieve. Taste to Raphael, who claimed healing futile. And texture to Uriel, who rude illumination as too metaphorical. Not that I can't handle it, he said. Then I stood back. One must delegate. Our only debate over taste, as I resisted salt, consider cinnamon or ginger, I said. What soothes can also be bitter, said my angel. I toyed with sky down, water up, but in corral they protested on logistical grounds. As for depth, I took suggestions and decided beyond what they can fathom. I'm loath to tell whose idea that was. Let's just say he no longer works here. The balcony. Get a load of that view. There's Catalina Island, overpriced but worth it. A pledge of paradise coarsened slightly by the bicycle for rent. I can measure the length of the San Clemente Pier from here. How it bullies my water, gesturing to the waves. Go around. There's always someone like that, pounding the gavel of self-interest. If I punished them all, there would be no time for diversions such as this moment, an immersion in lavender, which is not obsequious. The irony, these interruptions, their constructions, contribute to the panorama, a tribute to horizon. How fortunate they realized perspective. They surprise me, particularly their eyes. Umbrellas. I take full credit even for the truant ones strewn on streets after a storm, such triage. And those chaperoned by wind beckoned up, 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 their owner's hands abandoned, palms in supplication. I am infatuated with them. So they didn't rate the first seven days. I knew someone would dream them up. Look at my palms, their fronds, their lines. Don't tell me Louis Parapluie never saw a palm. One only needs so much imagination. What with illusion and translation. Do I need to draw you a map? My favorites have handles like scepters and abundant domes. Sand. It's not mine, but I should have seen it coming. The gradual pulverizing, you know, eventually it will all disappear, as will you. I did not mean for everything to get smaller. I did not mean for the rich, richer, and the poor, poorer, nor for everything to be fair. Though my translators bandy about justice and righteousness with abandon, as those words were meant to correlate to thoughts, as though ideas matter and things matter. Do dunes compensate? I did not invent intent. You did. And the way indented footprints disappear on the ocean's arrival, that was yours too. How eloquent. Here's more of the ocean. Ha! Still in the revenge phase, you know, and how you have to. to um, damage your predecessors in some way. Harold Bloom taught us, I guess I'm still damaging. More ocean, more ocean. Anatomy of disorder. And uh, this actually, this poem contains something that we don't have in Detroit in the newspapers, which is to say we do not have the surf report 
in Detroit. So, uh, but here we do, of course, and I think it's quite wonderful. And, uh, you know, it, it's really, it, it's almost verbatim. It's, it's quite a great thing. Anatomy of disorder. I know that longing listens to the surf report. Don't bother, no waves, hope on the northwest horizon. And burrows its head in Psyche's sand, emerging a castle with turrets, drawbridge and moat, subject to fits of mutability. Capability Brown reshaped the English garden from contrivance to the articulated wild. In his perfect hermitage, he was heard chiding a child, you can't escape landscape. And there you are on the back road to beauty and the sublime where the service is terrible. They have no work ethic, those two, always me, me, me. We say, pipe down, you're nothing special. But they keep emerging, bedraggled, buoyant with threat and decree. When Virginia Woolf puts stones like literature in her pockets to weigh down her corpus, and took a constitutional into the waves that broke and broke and broke. Each stone had its own shape, its own responsibility, complicit along with the sea. I mentioned in the previous class that I had borrowed um, that phrase, break, 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 and then this free previous poem, broke, 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 from Tennyson's famous poem titled Break, Break, Break. So I think I should read this one too. Break, break, break. The daughter is louder than the sea when the waves are calm and she is not. When the tide meets her on shore, she greets it by fleeing into the blur of a hot sun circle and a degree of sprawling cloud. I watch, not from afar. The waves crawl up my thighs, my arms recede and otherwise ignore me. I warn them, do her no harm. A set conveys my empty threat out to the powers that be. They ripple. If waves can laugh, this is a funny day. Say what you will, they say. As a poet, I sometimes give myself assignments, um, as you may receive from your professors or give yourself sort of little challenges. And um, I'm very interested in this book and sort of this dream state. And uh, so when I was thinking about dreams, I went to biblical Joseph, who is, of course, the great scriptural interpreter of dreams, who, according, according to scripture, interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, um, interpreted his brother's dreams and got in trouble for being arrogant, um, and uh, ultimately ends up in jail, just to remind you of the story, with a butler and baker, one of whom fares well, the other of whom does not fare so well. So I wrote three poems. This little series is called Three Friends. There's a great deal of sevens in these poems in the story, and so I elected to write each poem would have two stanzas. Each stanza would have seven lines. Each line would have seven syllables. So I'm sort of obsessive, you know, so that's how that went. And this is what came out, and there's three poems. The first is from the point of view of Joseph, and it's called Interpret This. Butler and Baker both dreamed, one of the vine, one of bread, one filled up the pharaoh's cup, one whose crumbs the birds devoured. You will be restored, I told the man whose night sang of wine. The other hanged, the birds supped. I told the pharaoh, only God interprets dreams. I hope you're on good terms, he winked. Fat kine and full corn mean plenty, withered ears of having none. 
famine, boom, bust. No one blinked. Once I dreamed I was the sun. Two, the butler's quandary. Pity the baker his head, now separate from his torso and served up tartare to birds hanged from the terebinth tree. If I seem hard, it's that I wonder, does dream instruct fate or from fate take its cruel cues? And pity poor Joseph, stuck in jail for being too good looking. I forgot about him, the good turn he did me. Now that Pharaoh's dreams of kine and corn keep us up at night, should I let Joe save the day? Three, the baker's lament. My specialty was angel food cake, harder than it looks. Inside each, I baked a small angel. Difficult to find unless you know their grottos and habits. They like to scratch the noses off our idols. Of course, my source was bound to dry up, and so my pastries. Jailed, I met a guy who sifts signs and symbols. I told him of the seven loaves atop my head and saw his fallen face. Ah, oh, say it ain't so. Joe. I want to veer for a second. Um, I brought, brought a couple of journals that I have poems in, of literary journals, one of which is Dirt Cakes. I want to hold this up. And Catherine back here is the editor. Would you raise your hand, Catherine? Thank you so much. Um, you know, for those of you who are poets or aspiring poets and are, you know, want to get published, it's really, um, it's so important to support literary journals. And um, so I wanted to bring a couple that have been gracious enough to publish my work. And um, I've been doing this for a while now, and I still get a huge thrill when I see a poem in a journal, and then I see the journal out there. Um, so I really want to encourage you to participate in the world in this, in this way of reading journals, getting to know them, and then submitting, seeing where you can find your place. It's really an important thing to do. So I want to read the two poems that, are, that um, Catherine took for this uh, issue of Dirt Cakes. And uh, one of the reasons I want to, I, I have, uh, I guess, this obsession with Joseph. He was kind of a jerk, which is probably why I like him. You know, women like jerks. Um, so it, it, it's, um, you know that by now. Um, so uh, this, this poem touches down with Joseph. Um, it's titled Rabbi, and there's a quote, one should await fulfillment of a good dream for as long as 22 years. Rabbi Levy. I am comforted by the imperfections of teenage Joseph who saw himself in pre-Ptolemaic fashion the center of his universe and family. If such an arrogant youth could become an agent of God's will, what's to stop me from correcting my smaller flaws? After all, I lack the boy's ambition have no designs on that brand of greatness. He dreamed big, mine are puny, and yet each autumn during the yearning and waning of Kol Nidre, I review a multitude of regrets, sins discreet and repeated. Even with new technologies, there is not time enough for me to right my wrongs, to make amends. Such time, what I dream of. Five and Dime. At the Cunningham's counter, the ghost of my mother orders the blue plate special circa 1967. Sections for meat, starch, and vegetable. Dealing with the worldwide problem of the vegetable medley, she separates peas from carrots from corn, eats peas and corns, abandoning the carrots, life not always fair. I pop a balloon suspended from a laundry rope, rewarded with a hot fudge sundae, Saunders hot fudge, the local brand, the best brand, pet milk caramels, buttermilk chocolate. 
My children starved for description of my childhood. What have I invented? To what end? I could fix it so the machine of my youth runs smoothly. So many are gone who would contradict my version, my myopic vision. I have worn glasses now for 40 years. I couldn't see the pale white addition on the blackboard but would not admit it. It took Mrs. Matthews, gentle, slim, to tell my education revering parents, she's a fine student, but I'm afraid she's not seeing what she should. Myopia in Canada. Welcome to Windsor. A big sign for Wong's Chinese hangs just past customs. All Detroiters go there. Her mom orders orange food. Her dad smokes Winston's. She gets wonton soup, propels the wontons around the bowl like boats in a harbor with no outlets. Her eye doctor's office just over, over the border, filled with mirrors, frames, photographs of models wearing glasses. She searches his ladies' magazines, her favorite column, can this marriage be saved, and thinks that the answers are so obvious. Her eyes get worse and worse. She can only see what's near. He fits her chin into the cup, so close to her face, his hands in the machine make her shy. He has a son her age. She hears lenses clicking while big block letters become clear and blurry, better, better, worse. In thick new glasses, she looks smarter and uglier. White letters jump off green exit signs. The windshield wears specks of dust. Everything she sees has three dimensions, almost four. Colors begging for attention. She has to close her eyes. Rest, dear, her mother says. The family stops at Tim Hortons, buys a box of Timbits for the ride. Even the donuts look more acute. She acts as though nothing has changed because nothing has yet. Familiar. The gun to my ear, soon a small explosion and a gold-plated post dotted one lobe. I was 18 and knew it would hurt. I knew that your earlobes have no, have no nerves was a friendly lie, a lie you embrace and pass down as though sharing pain lessens its memory. I read that the body can't remember pain. But I remember the ache of vice, a jaw brace with tightening screws. I'd waited so long because I hated my earlobes, their length and my hatred for pain, family legacies. The medic at Newman's Jewelers liked pain too much to be a healer, and he suited the heat-seeking crowd, the woman who yelled, Jesus Christ, when he held up the gun. Ear shootings always drew a crowd, and when I left the chair, my best friend acting as buffer zone, two or three onlookers touched me to verify what they had seen, prove I wasn't the shill and three-card Monty. Pierced, I called my mother and told her, except about the pain, because she feels pain for me. I bore a perfect child, she says. She goes and puts holes in her ears. Much later, a lover would tell me that lengthened earlobes was a sign of sensuality, a mark of intelligence. Later still, a man held a gun to my head, the muzzle lay against my hair as I emptied out my purse, wallet, pockets, and took off my ring and bracelet, scared and thinking, I have felt this before. You know, when I moved to California in 1992, I'm from, as you know, Detroit, and I've lived in Chicago and New York and Houston, all sorts of all wonderful places in their ways. 
in their own ways. And, um, but I would have people for a long time say to me, why do you live in California? Which I always think is sort of a strange question. I always wonder if people living in other places who have seldom other get this question as though it's so perplexing why we would live here. And um, I, so I, I came up with, this is sort of my answer to that question. And the title actually comes from early in Genesis, um, when God divided the light from the dark, divided. It is hard to explain the light here, earnest and aerobic light, not the complacent kind. It gets fired up by the ocean and believes in its own ability to reinvent the vapid into the vatic, the sore, serene, torpor to fever, tembler and squall to static. I know you have light in other places. I have lived in other places and found curb to pole star endearing. What can I say? Everywhere. Dawn wears its mantle of emblem, queuing insomniac, paperboy, baker. Here in these fringe towns yoked by Coast Highway and the old mission route, El Camino Real, we awaken neither more beautiful nor more true. But the light brings the possible on particle, seducing the muscles and liquids of your eye. The possible weighs little tastes like coriander or thyme and resembles its sister, the probable, whose features are more sharply defined, whose finest hour is dusk. I'm going to read um, three more poems and then wrap up. Driving Tricks. I was happy for the first time in a long while when I reached the hill's crest at El Moro Canyon Road, singing, no shouting, gesturing with both hands, Brandy, you're a fine girl, that song by a looking glass, a one-hit group who spun and sounded like the four tops. Brandy is some woman in a port town who waits for her honest but wandering sailor, though he's told her that the sea is his life, love, and lady. I was driving with the knees, my knees. I learned to do that in high school. It's a good trick, and it frees up your hands. My pal could drive with his teeth. We went to taco, taco, taco. My soccer coach called it bacho nacho because people got sick there all the time and a dead man was found in the weedy field next door. Another guy came with and held my wrist to show me he liked me, but I thought that was stupid. I wanted my hands held. I wanted a senior who gave me his glasses to hold while he drank from a cranky water fountain and I cradled the wire-rimmed frames in the cushion of my palm, careful not to stare too hard at the back of his head. At driver's ed, we learn control. We learn to tap the horn, the benefits of going slow. We learn to grip the steering wheel where 10 and 2 fall on the clock. But I like to hook my index finger under one spoke. See how close I can get to letting go. I wrote a series of poems um, called Epithalamion. This is a poetic tradition to write marriage poems. And as I was saying to this class earlier, usually when I try to write a love poem, it ends up being about death, uh, and, which is a sad turn of events. Um, and, 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 and other poems, when they start out sad, end up being a sort of celebratory. So it's, it's always a surprise to me. Um, this, this was a poem titled from the Song of Songs, Rise Up My Love, My Fair One, and Come Away. And um, it uses a little bit of local, of, of local uh, uh, geography. En route to Ave Maria at 10 a.m., crosses as flags, flags as crosses, the holy perpendicular mingling in the vault, closer to the pulpit as Pentecost nears. The North 405 splendor makes itself manifest. Timing rules when it comes to revelations. The female whale helium balloon banked halfway between firmament and car dealership. 
She is steadfast. Repeatedly, the fine citizens of Garden Grove shoot her down, and the owner patches her up and floats her to draw a motorist gaze to his wares, and she begins to acquire civil rights of her own, a square of air, a current, to represent the most plastic perseverance, yielding and unyielding, unconditional. Our friends, one in white, one in black, kneel and accept what we cannot. And the priest dusts even the non-believers with an affable blessing, so we are saved for a moment from our remove. I say anyone who wants to pray for me can, so long as there's nothing to sign and my soul goes unclaimed. Everywhere a Mary, a host of votives, long drinks of stained glass to soothe the parched narrative, twelve stations of shard and burden, lacunae between man as God as man, a billboard at turn of the century boulevard sacrifices its doubts to Octavio Paz, the road never stops arriving. And as we wend the streets of a long-ago mission town, pauses line lingering on my shoulder like the voice of conscience that faithful to can, the day's messages declare themselves, holy, 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 kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. When I hear these words, I rise up on my toes as my faith, pacing in the ante room, teaches a mere fraction of the morning signs and symbols. I want to grab them all for my friends as a pledge that they are not alone together, hopelessly fallen, driven, lost in a jumble of gesture, of vow. As a pledge that the world is with them, which you don't know and you never know. See, that started out as a really happy, affirmative marriage poem. I don't know what to say. That's sort of what happens. Anyway, I want to, um, again, thank you all for coming and thank Anna for having me. And I want to close with this poem, which is a love poem, California. The stones of a singing beach are thrown atop each other. When the tide remits, stones sing as the water sifts through, reshifting the layers like when I climb over then under you who sleep lightly snoring. If I were the day moon, showing its face with the sky still hysterically blue, I'd have the grace to look guilty, an icon of excess light. We have enough, can't you see? As for the birds who trill and prattle by night, I forgive them their obdurate tunes. They wake us so I can revel in your fairness. Thank you. Uh, we have a little time for Q&A, a uh, few minutes, so if anyone has a question, raise your hand, and I've got a microphone for you. Um, when you're writing poems where the speaker is God, how do you formulate that personality? How sure. much of it? How much of it do you respect and keep from religious traditions? How much of it is you as a person becoming the speaker? Where do you get the inspiration for that character? Well, in a way, I learned to do that in part after reading Louise Glick's wonderful book called The Wild Iris. And this is a whole, a whole collection of poems in which she writes from the point of view of God and of the flowers and of human gardeners tending the flowers. And so there's these three voices and three sort of this kind of hierarchy moving throughout the book. And I think it occurred to me that I could do that. You know, when you read somebody else do that, they give you license, right? You say, oh, that's, that's been done. I can do that. Um, I, you know, so I, and that book was, you know, I read that book when I was in graduate school and I, and I carried it around for a long time. And I, I thought, so I, that really was one inspiration. Um, I am not, I, I don't, I don't worry about being disrespectful at all, frankly. Um, I don't, it's not that I think it's not something to worry about, it's just not my concern. I think that I consider entering into a dialogue with 
issues related to faith as respect, you know, just, just entering into that dialogue. Um, and I come from a tradition where you get to argue with God and shake your fist at God. I come from a very um, uh, horizontal tradition versus a vertical tradition. So I'm very comfortable with um, putting on the gloves, you know, and, and, and I see it as giving respect just by engaging the questions. So... I noticed that you uh, memorized your last poem that mm -hmm. you read and, and read it from memory. Mm -hmm. How often do you memorize your own poems? Do you memorize other people's poems? Uh, how, how does that work? I prefer to memorize other people's poems. I have that poem memorized. It was in my first book. And, um, and it's really a love poem for living here and for my husband. And, for, and so I, I memorize it. It's, it's fairly short. And it just got into my brain. I probably, when I had written, my first book came out, I read around quite a bit. And I probably read that poem and sort of got it under my skin. And um, I always, I, I know, I, I, I like to read that during readings. It reminds me of how fortunate I am, in some sense, to be here, to have been brought here for whatever reason, by whatever. Um, so, but generally speaking, I like memorizing other people's poems, you know. And I encourage, I actually have my students memorize poems. I, my students recently had to memorize some Whitman, which is very difficult to memorize. Next, they're memorizing Dickinson. And I, it's, I told them it's going to be like a walk in the park compared to, compared to Mac. Because, of course, you know, one, di one Whitman line is really equal to one Dickinson stanza, you know. So, so they're going to have it much easier. Um, I, I, I do like memorizing other people's poems. I like getting their rhythms in my head and carrying around their diction and their language. I don't do it as much as I would like to, but I, I take pleasure in it, and I think it's really important. So I just happen to know that one poem of mine by heart. I, please don't think ill of me for, for it. I think we'll wrap up now. One person oh, back there. There is one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I just wanted to ask, when you write poetry, do you usually um, write it all out just, you know, in one go and then go back and edit? Or do you take time to sit and delve on each word before you write it out? Like, how? what's your usual style of writing poetry? I probably, that's a good question. I, I am not a one word at a time or a one sentence or one line at a time. I tend to sort of take a deep breath and try to play it out as long as I can and when I'm sitting down to generate a first draft, you know. And um, then at some point I have to exhale and take another breath and I kind of, you know, dive back in. So um, I, you know, I, I like, and, and when I'm working on a first draft, I really um, try to exhaust what I, what I know of the poem at that moment. Um, but if I wrote, and I do think, and I, I know one poet who claims that he, you know, looks up every word in a poem as he writes. I actually don't believe it. But uh, that said, we like to say those self-mythologizing <laughs> things, I think. But, um, but I, I do think every word is that important. And when I go back during the revision process, which often happens during that initial generation process, I'll sort of take a, an initial swipe at revision. I will go back and get out anything that seems that's calling attention to itself as radically unnecessary or excessive or prosaic. I try to get that, that stuff out right away because that's not the real work of the poem yet. It's sort of a, it's kind of a generative moment, and it's a nice time, um, but it's it's not the poet really isn't telling me any the poem isn't really teaching me anything yet at that point, so I'm anxious to get to that. But I've had but poetry writing poetry really has, has taught me patience because it takes a long time, you know. And I, I now know that you know a first draft is just that, you know, and that there will be many more. And so when I re-enter, I sort of look for different. I have different editing strategies focusing on lineation, focusing on verbs, trying to see, uh, you know, just trying to see where the heart of the poem is, what the impulse behind it is, where the poem seems to want to go versus me conducting the poem. I'm getting better at that um, over time. It's still, it's all, still always a challenge, you know, to this sort of battle of control for the poem between me and the poem. The poem always should win, you know, and it generally does. In my best poems, I think the poem is one. And that poem, California, it was the first poem, maybe one of the reasons I have an affection for it, is that it was the first poem I wrote that was so damn long 
And then it ended up being, you know, really roughly, roughly sonnet length. The lines are erratic, and it's not an argument, and it's not a, it's not a, um, you know, there's, it's not metrically. I mean, it's absolutely not a sonnet, but it's roughly sonnet length. But it started out as a hundred lines long, and I remember just having one of those kind of epiphanic moments in the editing process where I just was able to be brutal, and just able to go, you know, and chop, and then the poem emerged, and that was very exciting to me when I realized I knew how to do that, you know, and, uh, and that's always, it's always very hard. It's always very, very hard, you know, with the words you commit your paper to be that, to commit that sort of, I guess, <laughs> that do that violence to them. But then the poem came out and I still, the poems, it's one of my older poems. I still, I still feel something for it. I still like it. So maybe that's why that poem means something to me because I, I, I really, I exercise the kind of brutality you need to exercise in the revision process. All right, so we'll end on brutality. Yeah, um, there you go. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to thank Charlene Baldwin and Leatherby Libraries for hosting us this evening, and I'll give one more plug. Uh, if you liked what you heard or you want to gear up for the next poets, uh, make sure you stop by the Barnes & Noble table and, and buy a book. Let's give Patty one more round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Have a good evening. And she'll stick around for a couple minutes if you want a book signed. Thanks. <laughs>